I saw a poster, didn't actually know what was involved because I didn't read the details, but came along anyway. But I stayed, and because I hadn't used a sewing machine for a long time, I hadn't done any sewing for a long time, and got involved in the project, which was costumes of the 50s, 60s and 70s. Had a lot of fun, it was really interesting. There's information missing, not included in the pattern. Bearing in mind that this is a vintage 1950s pattern. So what it appears to be is that they are making the assumption in the 1950s that you have knowledge of the bits that they are not directing you to. Let's hope that it is a 12, because you think it says 34, then that indicates... Look at it size that, that looks as though that could be a 14. That's where I'm cutting then. That's yep. where you're cutting. Just round all these pieces and yeah. keep them all together. Round yeah? And round the board. And breathe. I started sewing when I started school because they started us off on the, the loosely woven fabric with the big holes that you did cross stitch in. I think everybody did that primary one. Late 60s, early 70s, I started doing different things in school. The war was on when I was at still at school. At, at one point we were only getting two hours a day. At one week you would go to school from nine till eleven. The next week you would go from eleven to one, and the next week one till three because they had taken over one part of the school for the fire brigade. I did teach myself to sew because the first thing I did was trying a piece of cloth and trying to sew two bits together in a straight line, and I learned that way. It's a great moment when a girl tries on the first dress she's made herself, and sometimes it's a struggle too. My mum had a sewing machine, and it was a Singer sewing machine, not electric. That, by the way, is the machine I started sewing on. It sat, it sat in our main room. A sewing machine. It was a treadle machine, right? Singer. Nobody had anything else but a Singer sewing machine. They were made in Clydebank. On the bottom there where the sewing box is sitting is the treadle, which you worked with your feet. And you had to get it started going the right way. There was a big wheel at the side, which you can see, which had a belt on it that drove the wheel on the edge of the, on the side of the machine. Initially you had to have strand so straight with your left hand and turn the handle with your right hand. And if it went the wrong way, your thread broke. So once you started with your feet, you had to keep going all the time. The sewing machine that I used was bought for my mother's older sister. And she was born, I think, in 1900 and it was bought for her 14th birthday, which would be 1914. It just did plain sewing on a treadle. Mm -hmm. And then my husband fitted an electric motor to it and it was a ton weight. In the old machine that uh, my gran gave me and made me promise I wouldn't get rid of it, it was a treadle one. Mm -hmm. So it was super for uh, doing thicker materials or thinner. And in fact, the cape that I made when I was expecting my son, it was Welsh tapestry and really, really thick. And it worked okay on that machine. Yes, but more modern ones are more complex. My interest in sewing actually started, I'd say, during the war. 
I'm 90, I'll be 93 in June this year. You had to make things out of other things. During the war, clothes were made of as little cloth as possible. I had a coat made out of an ex-army blanket, which was absolutely beautiful. I loved that coat. It was the first one I'd had for a long time. You ripped out other knitted garments and knitted something else with them. You had to find a way. And my sister, she made her trousseau out of um, parachute silk. <laughs> I was demoted from the Air Force in 1948, after four years. And at that time, the new look had started. Christian Dior, the big wide skirts. There was more material available. So it's perfect width for this, and I think we've got plenty of fabric to do what we need to do. There's no way that would have worked, would it? I was one of the girls that wore the new look when it was brought out at first. And though my father would say, that's far too long. I said, but that is a new look. Do you want me to cut it? No, just let go at the moment. No. <laughs> and the new look wasn't approved of because it took too much cloth. When the new look came in, that was lovely because you had more material and they could make clothes and full sleeves and all sorts of things. No, you've got to angle it. You've got to lift it. Watch your finger. I cannot do this, it's clear. You want me to start it, please? It's, okay. it's okay if you drip this well. It. Oh, it's not got to be done by 10 seconds oh now. Then you're all right, everything's fine. That's you, that's you. And my hat, and my gloves and my bag. And I thought it was a bee's knees <laughs> walking along <laughs> Sucky Hall Street. People wanted fancier clothes than they'd had for a long time. So everything was really spectacular and people wanted to make them as well as being able to buy them. And welcome to BBC News at 3. This afternoon we have been cutting pattern from 10 o'clock this morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. My father would turn in his grave if he walked up the high street in the summer and saw men walking about with no tops on, you know, and <laughs> shorts and women wearing shorts to here. You had to be able to match, you know. Mm. It, it, it was very much more formal. It's a good thing that's all gone now. I'm very pleased to say that because mm. it was really ridiculous. The new look stayed for quite a while and my dress has got longer as well. It's got darts to go in. It's not going to be all um, loose like this. It's going to be fitted. We're getting on fine. We have got to the point where we've done the bodice for the 50s dress. Mm -hmm. But we just have to be putting all our darts to allow for human shape. And the intention is to thread up the machine so that we can put the underskirt together. We had to have skirts that were fully circular. Had to be full. But then the cloth was soft. Nowadays you can buy cloth that's stiffened. We had to have a way of making our dresses stick out. It was like wearing crinoline dresses in the Victorian era. You had to stiffen it with a strong solution of sugar and water, which was fine till you went dancing. And it was ballroom dancing. And the boy's hands would be on the back of your waist and you'd be sweating and the sugar melted. <laughs> and you went home rather sticky round the waist. <laughs> You've stopped at the right bit. That's it. It's really interesting how you, cause like you just, we just walk into a shop and buy the kid dress, but it's better. It's, easy. it's good to find out how you actually would have done it eight years ago. Oh! Oh! Because it saves a lot more money than like, because you'd usually buy a dress for like 40 pounds out of like any shop. Mm. So it's easier, it would be better just to make it. That was what would be, now that would be 1950. Mm. 1950. I liked the pattern. There was uh, in influences in the films then, the bodice fitted into a, uh, the skirt. If you saw something that you liked, 
a particular film starred wearing where you would try and make them. The Dirindal skirt became very, very popular. That was a full skirt gathered into a waistband and everybody had those. <laughs> we made those as well. <laughs> I must have been about 17 or 18. I was attending the, the Lurito Convent in Mauritius, which was run by nuns from Ireland and England and France. It was about uh, 1955. Ready-made clothes were not on sale anywhere. People did their own clothes. That's when I decided I would have a go. My, my mother had got that sewing machine there that my father had imported from England. That's when I did the, the dress and I was quite proud of it. When I used to go to Copeland and Lies and get a material at their sale, and come home and make it and have it on the next night at a dance. <laughs> you just kept making clothes. As I say, Paisley was really lucky. You could get, go to the mill shops and get material. There were so many big stores like Lewis's, Pettigrew's, Copeland and Lye, Watt Brothers, and they all sold materials and patterns. It was very easily accessible. This one is me. I bought all the wool to knit this dress. And I started knitting it and working in two colours drove me absolutely crazy. So I bundled it all up and gave it to an aunt and said, here you are, <laughs> tell me when it's finished. <laughs> Eventually the fashion changed again and we went into straight clothes, you know, straight dresses. So we just got rid of all <laughs> the one and change to the next. The shape of the 60s is a box, I think. I thought, because there was a lot of space, space age silvery stuff, I've got silver lamé at home. What do you think, that much? The yeah. silver? Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of it was financial, that it was the cheapest way to, to get things was to make them yourself. My friends all sewed. And they all knitted. And we got quite proficient at, at doing these things. But, you know, as I say, into probably my mid-twenties, I couldn't have afforded to buy the number of items of clothing I was able to make. I wouldn't have had a wardrobe the way I, I had. Even when my mum was making things, uh, she would make all her clothes because it was just at the end, during the war actually. As uh, we got older, my brother was born and she did make a few things for him, but that was when people were buying more, they were more reasonable and um, we could actually made some stuff, but we bought it. The saying was, you're better to die than not be in the fashion. <laughs> we had dressmaking classes and I um, chose to make a mini dress. And at the time, this was great because my mum was very, very strict and would never have bought me a mini dress. But the nuns were helping us to make it. This was almost sanctioned by the Catholic Church. So I chose my fabric and I chose my pattern and I made myself a black frock with lots of flowers all over it and proudly wore it to church on Sunday. And as I say, had the nuns not been involved, I would never have been allowed to wear it to church in a month of Sundays. So from then on, I wore that dress until it fell apart. Into the 60s, things became a bit more psychedelic. I remember buying a dress and when I think about it now, I never ever wore it. And I just always said I bought that when the balance of my mind was disturbed. <laughs> it was so gaudy. Pull the foot up, pull that towards me. That's that up, pull that out, put that over. Done. So this is the top of the body part and this is the straps. The straps are going to join up to the back and then we're going to get the, the bottom dress part and connect it up. It was really good. I want to do it when I'm older. I like uh, designing things. 
These girls are enjoying a well-earned break from an end-of-term activity, a fashion show. This show is the climax of a whole year's work. I was very aware that other people, in, in particularly my class, like, I can remember things like bell-bottom trousers being the fashion, and Helena Johnson, who was in my class at school, had a red pair that her mum made, and I was so jealous. The trousers I wore were like hipsters. They just came to get hips and I was frightened in case they were going to fall off. <laughs> Zenga is wearing this trouser suit in navy crimply. This is 70s. And what we're trying to see is if we've got enough fabric just to just come can off the... Uh, in the 70s, I had hot pants with the bibs, two pairs, <laughs> and I had bell bottoms and flares and um, blouses uh, with the, the big shoulders, um, puff sleeves. No, it wasn't the 80s, the big shoulders, it was puff sleeves then. My sister had a pair of white jeans and I put the tap and down both legs for the Bay City Rollers. And that was her happy. <laughs> Shannon, what are you doing? What colour are you trying to? Oh, you're making a bag? What are you doing, Sophie? You're making a scrunchie? Yeah. See when you do that? Yeah. What are you doing? I'm for the animations. Oh. What are you doing, Gillian? I'm just pinning this bodice to the top main part of the dress, see? And if you need to hand it, just call me. You're going to be sewing it together. Okay. Have you found your ribbon yet? Mm. Found your ribbon yet, Shannon? I'm not sure if we should go for a gate or a white, because a yellow to Or you could maybe twist it together? I personally have found the project very interesting, not knowing entirely what to expect. Being the oldest, people in town, working alongside young ones who have no knowledge or experience at all and seeing them learning processes and at the same time finding things that I thought I'd forgotten about are actually still in my head and I do know a wee bit about what I was doing. You can see an evolution in the styles. Um, we're looking at the, the, the making of dresses but these were influenced by other social changes of the time. But ultimately, costume is part of a bigger social event. It's, it's one manifestation of what's happening in society at large. So we've covered three uh, decades, the 50s, the 60s and the 70s. And there is that evolution of style, of fabric, of mindset. Can I maybe even, although it's sewing, what are the social influences that that brought about these designs. <laughs>